Hello. Notebook may have just scrolled through. Hello, my name is Cass Holman. Uh, I am an associate professor of industrial design at the uh, Rhode Island School of Design, uh, as well as a, a designer in general. I founded a company called Heroes Will Rise uh, that enables me to um, uh, design and uh, get products into the hands of children. Um, that are guided by the needs of children rather than the needs of a consumer market, <laughs> which is, in my mind, the only reason to run a business. Um, I also um, have come to work with Angie Play over the last few years, and all of my work and, and what I'm going to describe and talk about today is um, a process of designing uh, tools for children to invent, imagine, design, and make and explore their own worlds uh, through play. Um, so I'm going to run through some of the ideals of those uh, of, of that type of design through a few of the projects that exemplify those uh, in my own work and then how those relate to um, Angie Play. And as a designer and as a, a, a person who believes in, of course, the process of play and, and how we might learn from it in our own uh, professional processes, um, I also will be talking a little bit about the failure in each of these designs of my own work um, and again how that relates back to Angie Play and the values of, of Angie Play. So um, one of the projects that I worked on um, in 2004 through 2008 was the Imagination Playground. This is um, in New York. These large building blocks uh, I think exemplify one of the goals that is a thread throughout all of my work, which is um, oops, uh, which is open-endedness. And, and this morning we heard quite a bit about open-endedness, and I wanted to define it a little bit. Um, there are two different versions, I think, of open-ended that's happening in these uh, uh, building blocks. One is that they don't have instructions, right? So children are able to use them however they want. There's nothing that says that any one of those blocks can't be either a, a car or a whale or an ingredient to make either of those things as the child's play needs them to be. Um, and the second way that, that um, the materials that I design are open-ended is that the, the, what they are and how they're used is defined by the child through playing with them. So the identity of the object itself, um, and I think often in the presentations this morning, it was, it was linked with a kind of false play. When the identity of the object is predetermined, then it can only be a car rather than also shifting through imagination into being a whale. Then in my mind, that is a, um, that is a failure in the design of that object. So in the, everything that I design, the identity um, is also open-ended so that what it is and how it's used is defined through play by the child. Um, and one other element that I think is present in the, uh, or that exemplified by the imagination playground blocks is the collaborative nature of them. Many of these in the early iterations um, were far too large for any one child to move. So of course, through wanting to, uh, to, to uh, engage with and make their own environments, they'll go home and find a friend and get help and, and wind up collaborating. Um, and in the case of these, uh, the Imagination Playground, these blocks were designed initially for one location, uh, so a public park, where ch children who don't know each other might come together and play. Um, and they have since, in the last, um, well, since 2008, they have found their way into thousands of schools and parks all around the world. But in my mind, they're still not good enough. The materiality of these I have very big problems with. I think that they they don't look like things that children find out in the world. They look like something that was designed for play, and therefore um, there's a, a missed opportunity there that I will describe momentarily. Um, another thing that is present in everything that I design is that children explore the spaces, the environments, the materials with their bodies, so that they're able to experience them, move through them, that they have, they, they have in it um, a physical, 
a multi-sensory way of exploring and experiencing different materials. Um, this is the 14th Street Y rooftop classroom, uh, also in New York City. Um, and this had some loose parts that also kind of plugged in and related to the environment. Um, and uh, unfortunately, in my mind, this fell a little short of what it could be in that it, it became in the way in its use kind of relegated to a playground rather than being a classroom. And I think in that naming of it and in thinking of it as an outdoor classroom, it would open up some more possibilities for how the teachers might engage it, uh, engage with it, and therefore how the children um, might come to understand uh, and spend more time reflecting on what was happening there. Um, this is Rigamajig, and this is one of the earlier sketches that um, I made in my process of designing um, the Rigamajig. So the materials that I designed uh, are always child-directed. Uh, and in child-directed, uh, it allows for the most invention on the, on the um, part of the children. So um, uh, in, in uh, allowing them to decide what they're going to build and how they're going to do it, oftentimes, and particularly with rigamajig, I think the nature of the, of the materials lend themselves to kind of contraptions and devices that work and that do things. Um, we see a lot of cranes and the children, uh, while it might, may look and, and kind of function, behave like a, like a crane, they see it as a way to lift something and in doing so, they invent it without it being titled as a crane and therefore each one of them every time is inventing a crane without knowing that in fact that it's something that has had, of course, decades of innovation, but rather a way to lift a bucket becomes uh, an, an opportunity to invent and, um, and design each time. Um, something that comes up when designing for these uh, open-ended and um, kind of non-prescribed and child-directed materials is uh, and whether or not, I often find myself asking um, how much to give them. How much is an invitation to invent and design, and how much is handing them the thing that I want them to invent and design? So with this as an example, um, this pulley here, a oh, pointer, there's a pulley in the center. And I, I spent um, some arduous months and many iterations trying to decide whether or not to give children the ingredients of the pulley so that they might figure out how to construct the pulley themselves and maybe never know that it was a pulley, um, but use it as one. Um, or hand them a pulley as a way of inspiring them to make things that might use a pulley. So in, in designing these types of child-directed plays, I think about what can become a clue or a cue for them to then jump in and figure out new things. Um, I also uh, look for ways that, that we can simplify some process and able to enable others. So with the case of Rigamajig, um, uh, I wanted them to be to spend a half hour building something giant rather than spending a half hour mastering how to use a screwdriver or a wrench. So I took the wing off of a, off of a hex nut in the hardware and put the wing on the bolt rather than the nut so that children are able to use their hands and they didn't have to master a tool. Um, and so what that means is that they can have, get into the, be in the flow and be experiencing the, the challenge of uh, building something collaboratively and be engaged in something that's both rewarding but also not completely easy um, while not getting frustrated with having to some of the, the tools and things that find motor skills that maybe they're not quite there yet. Um, and one of the ways that I know that my designs are successful are when children make things that I never would have imagined and this is a great example of that and just briefly um, they, they were playing together for, I think, an hour and a half, and in the end, they wanted to show me this. And she described it as uh, an, a flying elephant fairy and pointed out all of the different elements and details of it. And the, her brother said, this is a spaceship with a water slide. How, what are you even talking about? But they'd been, they'd been playing together beautifully for you know, the hour and a half or however long. You know, which should go there, put this over here, it looked like a perfect, they were so in tune conceptually, and, uh, but had totally different ideas. 
Uh, but, but briefly, just to, because I said I would, the failure in rigamajig, um, and it has been, it's, uh, uh, it's used in almost a thousand schools and institutions in the U.S. Uh, and in a few uh, peppered around worldwide. Um, but what I'm finding is that because the model of education in which rigamajig is being used uh, does not have... Um, uh, does not include some of the other elements that, that uh, would allow the children to reflect and really be engaged in a project without there being some desired outcome, without like the learning being marked by it being a crane or a simple machine or a lever. Um, I think that it hasn't quite lived up to its potential yet. Um, and then of course that brings us to Anji Play. Um, and Anji Play is the most ideal exemplar of everything that I've been designing for for 15 years. <laughs> um, and in 2005, uh, Jesse Cofino and Dr. Chelsea Bailey found me. They had been in schools in Anji and uh, seen some of my materials in use there. And so they reached out. And I visited an Anji Play school, and my mind was blown, <laughs> as many of you, I'm sure, experienced. Um, uh, since then, Ms. Chung and I um, have been working together uh, along with her principals and a lot of the teachers in the schools to kind of standardize the materials, make them a little easier to, uh, as they find their way into more and more schools that are going to be using the Anji Play and that are using the Anji Play model. Um, and on occasion, we get to design some new things, but the first step was kind of uh, trying to standardize the um, hundreds of materials that are already used. So in doing so, um, we have a number of things to consider. Some that I mentioned earlier in terms of balancing what is intuitive and what is challenging with what is frustrating, what is too difficult. Um, and primarily with the Anji Play materials, um, I learn so much every time that I um, sit down and talk to uh, the teachers and principals of the Anji Play schools um, because the assumptions that I make about how uh, a material or what makes sense about in a material um, is rooted in, of course, industrial design rather than being rooted in uh, the, the child's play experience. For one example is uh, with the ladders that we see, um, there, there were, we were seeing two, two different materials. And I said, well, that's easy enough. Let's just make them out of one material. And, and Ms. Chung kind of said, but then they won't get to experience that one is heavier than the other. And when you knock one on the ground, it makes a completely different sound. Bamboo feels different than pine. And so we've, like, we've, we've taken away the opportunity to explore, to explore materials while they're playing with the ladder. Like, why are you assuming that a ladder is just for climbing on? And I was like, oh. Amazing! It's so smart! <laughs> so, humbling experience at every turn. The things that I think that are a no-brainer are absolutely um, something to be deeply considered. So, um, uh, let's see. Another example of this, um, one of the first schools that I visited in Anji, um, I saw this, and I assumed that these ceramic jugs were uh, kind of buried into the ground as a way, you know, so, so that children can leap from one to the other. Um, but there was something that I, you know, I kind of said, this is, that's interesting. It, maybe these children have really long legs. These seem like they're kind of far apart. Like, are these students in the Anju Play School exemplar leapers? How, do, how are they doing? <laughs> and, um, and, I, and I said, well, it'll, it'll make sense. And as I looked around, this was, we were, we were visiting a school before any children were there. Um, but I kind of kept making, you know, I, I said, I want to remember to check back there. Um, and uh, at some point, um, the children came out, and it became very clear that the, the jugs were just far enough that they actually couldn't leap intentionally, could not leap from one to the other. So if they wanted to get from one to the other without getting eaten by crocodiles or falling through the sky or the flame that is the grass, they would need to go find a way to get from one to the other. So again, um, the kind of the, the cue of, you know, this, this is something that is, is inspiring or interesting or curious to interact with, and that just being the invitation 
to problem solve or to play or to invent a way of interacting with that. Um, I think in the interest of time. So, um, uh, in part of my own process, as a designer, um, I have a rather complicated relationship with failure. <laughs> as, and actually, I should say, I don't know that that's exclusive to artists or creative people. I think many of us have rather complicated relationships with failure. Um, I have ideas, I get excited, uh, I invest a lot of time and energy, and uh, the, it often comes up, comes up short, right? Um, and uh, in play, of course, the failure is the learning, right? Uh, and I, uh, as, an, as an industrial design professor, uh, I work with, with design students at, at university. Some of them are in their are 20, 22 year olds, and some of them are graduate students, so they're in their 30s. Um, and it's amazing how much better at failure <laughs> children are than adults, my, my students. And I think my students might, are probably even better at failure than I am. Um, as an adult, more of an adult, I don't know. Different, different level of, adult, different stage of adulthood, we'll say. So, um, so I remind myself and my students constantly that in fact, failure was a place that we learned, right? That you, in this stage, the goal was to get the, the board across a stack of blocks. But in something else that you do, the goal is going to be how to move, how to more effectively move blocks. And you'll have learned it through not putting your blocks in the right place to begin with, right? And so um, I think one of the more important things that happens and what I, what I try to remember to design for, and what I'm reminded of all the time in Anji Play Playgrounds, um, because the materials are open-ended and child-directed, is that in failure, we learn, in fact, how to have ideas, how to invent. We learn how to uh, proceed and that, in fact, the failure is often uh, much more meaningful than whatever outcome we were trying to achieve at any given point. Um, so, um, oh, I may have to add some of this. Just a couple of examples of Thank goodness for icons, because I can't read any of this. So, um, in, in, in this video, um, I like to call this video, Easy is Boring. <laughs> um, one of the things that happens, and I think we've, we, you know, we're familiar with the, the barrel swap game, uh, but one of the things that I love about what's going on here is that as they have invented their own game, at the point that they've mastered it, they then automatically move on to make the game more difficult, of course, with help from a friend. Right? So I watched this this barrel swap game evolve, and, um, and if, they, if, it, if they fell or if one of the barrels didn't kind of do what they wanted to, they would redo it. But each time, as soon as the, the minute that it worked, they would move on. Um, and I think that, that the lesson in, in Easy is Boring is a very valuable one when thinking about uh, and, and, and when working with um, the principals and Ms. Chung for Anji Play Materials, I see this is implicit in all of the designs. That again, we want them to work, but we want them um, working doesn't mean necessarily that it's easy and that the, the material does the work for them. We want them to be able to decide what works, what makes the material work. Um, and lastly, In this video, I in part love it because it's the coming together of Rigamajig, one of my designs, and some of the Anji Play materials. 
Um, but I also love it because it exemplifies uh, one of the more important elements of play. And maybe what these children have made, maybe what they've done is an experiment um, uh, in a fulcrum or uh, of simple machines or of leverage. Maybe it's an experiment uh, with balance. Um, but more than likely, maybe it's all and absolutely none of these things. Uh, at its core, it is a really fun, engaging, challenging thing to do with their peers. And isn't that, in fact, the point? Thank you. <laughs>